Hello and welcome to part two of the introduction to the legacy of the Battle of Trafalgar. And this is looking at Lord Nelson. Really, it's all about what was his greatest battle because Trafalgar is a very good battle and it is a very complete victory and a time which matters. And he does set it all off in a beautiful style for those who want to make a mythology out of it by dying at just the right point when you can ignore all the human bits of his personality. After all, gods, gods as Victorians imagine them, not as Greeks imagine them, or any of those deities which inspired so many of the ships that the Royal Navy was tooling around in at this time, are not in any way as pure. One has to wonder why the Victorians were so obsessed with making things so pure, so perfect. Everything had to be so neat. Before we get into Nelson's, you know, actual battles, we've got to discuss some of the issues which have come about recently. There's a letter, which is not new history because a friend published a letter which he claims was written by Nelson and which is being examined to see if it was really written by Nelson or not. And he wrote, publishes a part of the letter, not the full letter at all, but it's a part of the letter, which he claims supports the political campaign that person is involved in some years after Nelson has died. And that friend is campaigning for the maintenance of the slave trade. You have that on one side. We don't know what the letter was that was written to Nelson that elicited this response. We don't know the exact, you know, if the letter is true. What we do know, Nelson never really made any public statements, never really got involved in politics, is that he had a crew which was incredibly diverse on all his ships this period a fleet which was incredibly diverse had hundreds if not thousands of people from different nations different races ethnicities aboard the ships because the royal navy picked up sailors wherever they could in the world we know that while he did serve in the caribbean he not only took some escaped slaves honours crew, which gave them protection. I meant they were safe aboard his ships. But he also secured a Haitian general and his servant as crewmen aboard his ships when the French were trying to hunt them down during a period of peace between Britain and France, which could have arguably caused war with France, but he felt was the right thing to do to give them protection and give them safe passage. And yet, it's perfectly possible he also wrote a letter. Human beings are complicated, aren't they? What's really interesting is that this letter was published as part of a political campaign, as said after his death. It's nothing we haven't known about for years. Everyone's known about it. It's been an openly acknowledged fact. It, no one's been keeping it a secret. It's been a secret because in my, it hasn't been a secret. It's been sort of obfuscated, hidden, because it hasn't fit with the narrative. A very simplistic narrative, because that was what the Victorians were looking for, really, when their historians were looking back, and subsequent historians have been looking back, because of what's been put on Trafalgar. And I discussed this far more in the live, in the seminar, than I'm going to here, because it's quite a long-winded subject. 
and this is an introduction and I do aim for these to be around the 30 to 40 minute mark and I think I spent a full most of an hour on it in the live. This is going to focus on what was, was it Nelson's greatest battle? Was Trafalgar Nelson's greatest battle? Well, we've already done an entire video which looked at the battle and the star of it, HMS Africa. Now, let's look at some of his other battles, really. The Battle of the Nile. It's always marketed as Nelson's great victory. Nelson is considered this decisive, amazing leader. Nile is a great one. But as I always try to point out, he was a, it was a generation of very good officers, but they were also building on a generation of previously good officers. And he's not so much a maverick as Royal Navy officers at this period were trained, encouraged to exercise initiative. Hence, it's actually Captain Thomas Foley who should be considered the initiative here. Nelson has explained to his captains what he's going to do. He's going to attack at once if he sees the enemy. He is going to attack because his job is to take that fleet out. Take the fleet off the board. That is the job. Nothing else matters. You take that fleet out, it doesn't matter whether that army's in France or in Egypt. It's trapped. It's not getting anywhere. It can be dealt with when the British government choose to deal with it. If they choose to deal with it, it might just starve wherever it's left. Another, another officer might abscond with its commander, leaving it under command of another officer to be defeated in detail. Captain Sidney Smith gets up to a lot of fun. We'll leave that to another side. Though. So really, it's HMS Goliath's captain, Captain Thomas Foley, who spots the gap. He spots the gap between the, and I am remembering the name, the Goodyear and the Northern Shoal. And he goes around, and other ships follow him, while Nelson leads a group in on the side, on the open seaward side. And so they're doubling up on the fleet. The French can't move. The French have got crew ashore. They're manning one side of their batteries only, because they've got about half their crews on their ships. And suddenly they've got ships on both sides. And what do you do? There is no good decision to make in that moment. You have been caught. And it's seamanship that's caught to you. It's the ability to not follow the rules. But to follow the spirit of the rules caught you what do you do no. the french are not bad officers they're not bad sailors they're not as experienced they don't have as much sea time and they don't get as much sea time as the royal navy do but they're not bad and yet here they are completely caught out completely you know unable to do anything really to stop what's coming upon them l'orient the flagship puts up a good fight admiral brie uh, tries his best he really does but his flagship blows up underneath him weight of shot and this is after the full fleet has managed to get in of nelson so he's really running to ram home the attack with his initial load of ships he's managed to do most of the operator to maybe mostly knock down the front the van of the fleet and he'd been held up by the but once the cheese blown they can move on in detail and in the end, only two of the ships align and two frigates get away. This is warfare on a scale which the Royal Navy's been heading to, but other nations haven't really realized the Royal Navy's reached. In that what you've got 
is the years of naval war, the years of blockade, the knowledge that, frankly, Britain doesn't have a large army, so it's got to be a navy which has got to keep it safe, has got to keep its trade safe, has got to keep its empire safe, to keep the economy, to keep the nation safe. The pressure of that and the fact that the unique setting almost that Britain has in terms of its politics at the time and its its other constitutional affairs and the way it's organized and relative stability of command in that it hasn't had revolutions in it for a while, not since the Reformation and Therefore, sort of, I, mean, I suppose the Glorious Revolution, but we'll leave that to one side, left quite a lot, most, a lot of officers in post. It's a consistency of officer corps and consistency of knowledge base and consistency of NCOs and building up means that you have a machine almost. You have a very professionalized naval force and their business, as they understand it in peacetime, is to preserve the peace. But in war, it's to preserve the, the economy of Britain, preserve Britain, and that is most best, easiestly done by clearing the sea of their part of their private uh, privateers and frigates, and destroying their battle fleets if they venture out. And this action, the interesting thing about the Nile is other actions, they are fought in a way which is to capture or to fight, Suede. Uh, you know, they're a fleet action. This is a fleet parked up. They should be strong here. They should, it should be a terrible job for the Navy, the Royal Navy to get in. It should have been an absolutely devastating losses that they should be taking. And yet it isn't. They're inflicting them. Because someone looked at a shoal and thought, eh, there's enough space for me to squeak through there. And not only did one officer think that, but a lot of us thought, well, if Goliath can do it, Let's have a go. Now is also an interesting battle because, of course, uh, it classically happens because Nelson is dashing so fast. He gets his fleet moving at such a high speed. They reach Egypt. They don't find the French there, so they presume the French have gone somewhere else and dash off again. And he actually does almost a sort of a bit of a triangle and ends up coming back, trying to hunt them down. And the reason he's, he's gone past them both times, and then he comes back and finds them there, and they're in Abakir Bay. But it's a great battle. It's not my favourite of his victories, but it is a great battle. and. It's another one that shows that maybe Trafalgar isn't quite so exceptional in terms of level destruction. Numbers of the fleet involved, maybe. But level of destruction wrought, maybe not. Copenhagen, round one, 1801. We've done a whole video on 1807. <sighs> Why? This battle is, of course, famous because of Parker's, uh, Parker's signal. And apparently he tells his flag captain in po uh, Pocock, um, this in his book, I will make the signal of recall for Nelson's sake. If he is in condition to continue the action, he will disregard it. If he is not, it will be an excuse for his retreat, and no blame can be intrigued to him, imputed to him. 
it's important. Remember, in one of our, some of our previous videos, uh, previous videos, I've discussed the Articles of War and Admiral Bing's, and what happened to son versus what happened to father. And you can see there's a level of protection going on there. He, of course, ignores it. And Elephant is parked right in the middle, so you could excuse him for claiming he couldn't see it. Elephant is circled in red. Interesting enough, they actually... <laughs> it's one of those interesting battles where the Royal Navy basically goes... Well, Parker and Nelson have a conversation. And all the shallow-drafted 74s... <laughs> or the shallower drafted 74s available, go in with Nelson, because they can make it in there. And all the heavier ships, of well, I'll stay out with Parker. And Nelson trans transfers to a 74, and he picks HMS Elephant. <laughs> to this day, I think Nelson was having a joke with everyone. After all, he was supposed to be getting in and going for a shallow drafted everything he goes for a ship called elephant yes yeah, she's shallow drafted in comparison to the first rate he was on previously but she's called elephant tell me he's not exercising a sense of humor and after this nelson does exercise some very good independent action he goes off in to deal with a russia and overall them with a fleet Which is the whole point. They weren't. They were worried about the Copen the Danish fleet from two perspectives. One, it's supporting the French. Copenhagen took care of that. And two, it blocking their access to the Norway and the wood from Scandinavia, which they needed for their masts of their ships. The Danish fleet could do that, and the Russian fleet could do that. So they defeat the Danish, and then they go in and explain to the Russians in a very practical and visible way. Hello, we're big, we can reach you. Please don't cause us trouble. And the Russians decide not to cause them trouble. At this point. Sorry, I, I'm remembering, I'm remembering uh, Pitt the younger mobilizing the fleet versus Catherine the Great and her just basically going and so but there's a difference between Catherine the Great and other Russian rules. Let's be honest if she'd been in charge there probably wouldn't have been the revolution in 1917. But the potential leaders of it would have all been dead in 1915. And then there's Cape St. Vincent now. Cape St. Vincent is cool because Nelson does this action, which is always marked out as, it's really exceptional. It shows how independent he is and how brave he is that he could do this. Well, he is, again, he's acting within the spirit, but not a letter, letter of the instructions given to him by Jervis. But he is a Commodore, so he has some freedom. And more important than that, other officers are doing exactly the same, acting in the spirit, if not the letter. They're doing all sorts of things. Collingwood is. Trowbridge is. All sorts of people are doing this sort of thing. Nelson is good. I don't want people going away thinking he's not good. But I cannot over overemphasize. Modern history has decided he's a maverick. Victorian history decided he was the ideal of a naval officer. All of them have picked up parts of his personality and parts of his story. But they often do it by ignoring the context and ignoring the whole person. And actually, I would say the whole person is a far bigger, far more interesting, far more heroic person than the bits of the story they pick out. Because, guess what? The Victorian story sanitizes him, takes away his humanity, in many respects.
and the maverick story takes away from his intelligence he knew when to push he knew how to push he didn't always push just for the sake of pushing sometimes he'd be very very conventional sometimes he'd be completely unconventional he would evaluate the situation and make a decision he wasn't a maverick he was a thinking officer today one of the things that often goes around you often hear is yes he wouldn't survive in the modern navy he would have been kicked out because of this he wouldn't have been kicked out nelson was a thinking officer he's only a maverick if you only look at a small portion of his career and you go oh he disobeys orders he doesn't disobey orders in sort of you have to be going i'm doing giving a strict letter order following here i think myself he wouldn't have lasted long in the navy because he didn't like peacetime navy he wasn't that good in a peacetime navy he got bored he didn't like the constabulary duties but there again he possibly have been in submarine service considering his heights and dimensions and they are never really not they are never knowingly bored they always have something to go and snoop up on and do and uh, something high risk so frankly or he might have followed the other very very short person uh, that we all know of in naval history and all vaunt which is of course winkle brown who is a test pilot again a small very intelligent naval officer That is what Nelson is. All these other descriptions, they take away his agency and they limit him. They make him boring. This battle is interesting because some people, the famous quote is, I have a die a hero, a live a hero after this. Well, maybe he said it. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he did a Caesar and rewrote wrote it into his history afterwards in a nice letter. Veni Vidi Vici, anyone? He ends up capturing the San Nicolas because the captain, his ship, is damaged severely. And basically the only option to get to actually do anything is to bash into the San Nicolas, which is also damaged. And he manages to storm and take the San Nicolas. And then the San Joseph comes close enough is also damaged and they end up bashing to her so what's the options sit on the san nicholas while the san joseph pounds you to anything when you can't really take over the cannon and start firing back at them and you can't really fire through the san jo uh, san joseph uh, the san nicholas to the san joseph because the ships aren't at a right angle or board are you bored he made a decision. He was a thinking officer and he made a decision. And sometimes he made the wrong one. Sometimes he made the right one. But he made a decision. His career was not all glory. Not by any stretch of the imagination. He had some wins. He had some losses. On the win side, there are some big ones. Now, Copenhagen, Trafalgar, Cape St. Vincent, technically under uh, Jervis's command, but interesting style. Highs Islands, Genoa, Siege of Calvi. All the bolden ones are the ones where he's actually at sea. The ones are mostly amphibious operations. And I would like to point out he really doesn't do well when it comes to amphibious operations. So, if anyone replies to this video and goes, but you say Michael Clapp is a better naval officer than Nelson, so why are you telling people that they should look at Nelson for their career? Well, A, the history of Nelson is far more public than the history of Michael Clapp is. And B, you should look at both. No one should be modelling their career on just one other naval officer these days. You should look at all of them.
to learn them if this is what you're doing for a career, or if you're interested in naval history, you should look at all of them. History is more than just one person. And you can learn from more than one person. The joy of being a human is synthesizing in the lessons of multiple people. Good and bad. And you can get some draw you can find out some bad lessons from good people and some good lessons from bad people. Although there are some bad people who I would really prefer uh, prefer people not draw too many lessons from. And there are some good people, honestly, I'd prefer they didn't draw too many lessons from, but we'll leave that to one side as well. <sighs> The Siege of Malta, he turns up to assist, um, doesn't really do more than get annoyed with Trowbridge, who by this point is his uh, flag captain, when they go a bit too close to one of the forts, it starts firing on them, and Emma Hamilton won't go down below deck, so he, Nelson doesn't mind being in range himself, he does mind the woman he's by living at this point, living with almost openly as his wife, aboard ship, being put in danger. And let's put this in another context. Nelson hadn't really been ashore for long in a le for that long a period. I think total of about twelve months over an eleven year period. He'd actually been ashore. There are people who sit there and go, oh, the scandal and all these things. I'd say that makes him even more super today, because what did he do? He fell in love. That's terrible. Did it make him desert his post? No. Did it make him a little bit more annoying and truculent to command? Probably, but there again, most people are. Would we prefer he fell in love with his wife for producing a pure, a pure history? Probably. Speaking as, a ch as someone who grew up with parents who divorced, I'm not that happy with him for it in terms of Doing, having an affair and breaking marriage? Do I consider him a bad guy and someone who I don't want to study his naval side for it? Not really. Why? Well, I remember the lesson from Scrubs, which Dr. Cox taught, I think, and Dr. Reed, when she was wondering about her men whether she could use Molly as a mentor when she realized that Molly, who was the I never really learned Sonny off, was the psychologist. Didn't exactly have the best taste in men for her boyfriend. Dr. Cox asked her, well, is she a good doctor at her job? Yes. Does she understand the medicine? Yes. Has she made you a better doctor by working with her? Yes. Then what does it matter what she does at the weekend? You're not there to learn her personal life off her. You're not there to learn that uh, that you are there to le you're learning you want to make yourself a better doctor it's a professional relationship if she's your friend that's great you worry for her as a friend but you can't live her life for her and it's the same with people from history these things happen how often did nelson manage to see his wife in those 11 years not a lot in fact a lot less than he saw emma hamilton and geography was a big part of that, because of where he was in the world versus where she was. But let's also consider this, the losses. Not only were they really looking over his personal thing when they're giving him commands, his, pers his personal life, they are also looking over his losses. He has had losses. You think about that in terms of modern command. Modern war, modern fleets, modern things. 
Nelson is held up as this brilliant naval officer. And yet he had failed. He failed. That's a great hero for the modern Navy. Think about the perfection ideal which is often used for officers, the pressure that's put on them. They cannot make a single mistake. If they make a decision and it goes even, it's even slightly outside the book thinking and it goes wrong, they'll be kicked out of the Navy. Follow the rule. You're basically drummed in. You have to, you have to follow the rules or be incredibly lucky and nothing ever go wrong. And even if it does go right, if you don't follow the rules 100%, you can still get kicked out of the Navy. No matter how good officer you are. And yet, the officer who apparently is being held up as this paradigm of virtue that all naval officers should aspire to, but is now no longer suitable in some people's views because of this sort of virtuous thing, uh, as a modern officer from modern day because he disobeys rules, on occasion, he doesn't even display the rules. He interprets the rules, uh, the requests, instructions loosely, figuratively rather than, how do I put this? He interprets them rather than just literalize them. He failed. He failed and he still went on to one of the most senior posts in the fleet as a vice admiral and commanded the battle which is held up as one of the most brilliant examples of naval sea power and warfare to have ever taken place he failed and he still got to the top he failed and he was still able to prove himself he failed and he was still trusted That seems perfect to me. That seems exactly one a sort of the hero that you want to have putting forward for Navy today. We will train you as best we can. We will give you all the encouragement we can, and we will send you out there. And what matters is you make a decision because if you make a decision, less people are going to die. Because honestly. In war, when you hesitate, it gives the enemy time to think, and that's when you start to lose the you know, lose. You need to be thinking whilst acting. You need to be an intelligence naval officer. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong. But don't worry. The greatest naval officer in our history, as far as the national memory is concerned, the one who's got a huge statue, uh, statue on top of a even bigger column in the center of our capital. Don't worry, he fecked up half a dozen operations and he still got to be the leader of the fleet. Not only did they do that, he also had a very rich personal life. It was messy. It was human. Oh, and he may have had political views which are now very wrong in modern thinking, or alternatively, he was he chose friends poorly, and they marketed him having these views to make their own political points after he died. So either he needs better choices in civilian friends, or seemed to have acted one way and had political views the other way for a different for some reason. Who knows? As said, humans are complicated. That's a hero you need to look up to. So, where else to find me? Twitter, at AAC underscore Naval History, Patron, AC Naval History, 
Global Maritime History Patreon is where you'll find all the slides. If you like this video, please do press the subscribe button down below and the little bell next to it to be alerted when there are lives and when there are more videos. And thank you to all my patrons and thank you to all my subscribers and everyone who likes these videos. It really means a lot. Thank you. What else do we have coming up? Well, we don't have the ships that the Fisher scrapped on 22nd. That was Legacy of Trafalgar. That's been moved back to the 5th of November. But we do have the Treaty of London on the 27th, and we have Brew Ships, the book reviews, on the 25th, this Sunday. And Amphion class cruises on the 29th, which I'm looking forward to. I do like my Amphion class. Thank you. Take care.